Point number five. I like turtles. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, folks and goats. Welcome to the Command Valley. I am one of your hosts, Griffin. Joining us today is my good friend, Landon, who joins us sometimes. Hey, guys. It's Landon. And I also have my other friend, Caleb, here as well. Hey, guys. This is Caleb. And this is your first podcast episode. This is my first podcast episode other than the set review. The review. Set review. <clears throat> yep. So, yeah. This is just one of our regular non-videoed podcast episodes. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a crazy time in the world, but, you know, nothing's less crazy and more normal than talking about Commander. So, that's what we're going to do today. The topic that we have decided for this for today's episode. We've seen a lot of videos and podcasts and people talking about things that you need in Commander, uh, things that you should be playing, things that you should be doing. So we thought it would be a good idea to go through some of the things that we think you shouldn't be doing in Commander or things that you don't need in Commander. So without further ado, here are the five things that you don't need in Commander. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, you just have to take everything that we say with a grain of salt. This is coming from our perspective and how we like to play Commander, and it's also based off of the games that we've played, the things that we see. This might not be true for you, but we think that it's just an interesting thought experiment and just some things that are good to think about, just food for thought. So we're not claiming to be the know-it-alls for Commander, but these are just some fun things that we thought about. So Yeah, this is conclusions that we've came to after playing our years of experience of Commander. It may differ from your guys', but yeah, we're here to make an interesting conversation uh, in the realm of Commander. And to add just to the community. Hopefully this doesn't sound too negative. We're not trying to be overly negative, but... We're going to try to make this positive. I, th yeah. I, think, I think, if anything, this is going to be more helpful because you have to think about so many things when you're playing Commander, mm -hmm. when you're deck building. I think the list that you've got here is just going to be so much more helpful. It's going to help simplify some things. Yeah. <clears throat> At least that was the goal of, of why we... I'm going to say we, but Griffin did most of the work. All the work, actually. We. Why Griffin uh, chose these topics. We are one. And this could also go in, in conjunction with our last episode where we talked about five things that you can do like right now to make your deck better. These are five things that you can do or five things that we you don't really need to do and still improve uh, your gameplay and hopefully you're just your commander experience. So let's get into the first point. Cool. So before I go into the first point, just an introduction to all of these. I have found that there's a lot of talk in the EDH community about some of these things. And I feel like the conversation should be brought up that there is too much of a expectation in Commander for a lot of people. And sometimes it, it makes the game less fun. It makes the game uh, more linear. There's not as much creativity that goes on because there's such this imaginary structure that people are trying to put on the game simply just, just from playing. So hopefully, yeah, these five points are gonna be able to make loosen up the, the the bones of Commander a little bit. So the first thing that we collectively think that would make your playing experience better that you do not need, and this is probably one of the points that we've talked about the most in our group, you do not need, in our opinion, an expensive mana base, especially with this whole conversation about the fetch lands being reprinted in the secret layers. It is my honest opinion that you do not need to have an expensive mana base full of fetch lands. You don't need to have the dual lands. You don't even need to have shock lands. These are all expensive products that if you have them, great. I mean, it's awesome if you have a mana base that's completely consistent 100% of the time. It makes the game go a lot smoother, I feel like, a lot of the times when you get that stuff, but you're absolutely right that, I mean, I lately I've been taking out a lot of my dual lands and, and things like that. Not. Not necessarily the, the OG duels, but I've been taking out a lot of my coming to play tap duels for just uh, basic lands, and, mm -hmm. and that helps my deck a lot. But I get why people would want to have fetch lands and want to have OG duel <clears throat> lands or shock lands for all the colors that they need for each of their decks because it does make it run a lot smoother. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to say, at least in the case of fetch lands, I'm going to say the percentage that you would see, let's say you put three fetch lands into your deck. That's three lands. Yep. I think the percent of games that you're going to see those fetch lands is so small, I don't think that you're going to notice a difference. Somebody that I follow on Instagram actually like ran the math and like calculated the percentage of the time you're going to see the fetch lands if you were to include all of the ones that you could in like a three color or two color deck. And it's so insignificant that it's just a waste of money, honestly, yeah. if you're in a one or two color deck. I could see a soft argument for three a three color deck, but I don't think that your deck is any stronger um, or more consistent with uh, fetch lands. At that point, it basically, I mean, it is mana mm. fixing, but it doesn't it doesn't 
really help you get out faster, you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think if you've built your mana base correctly, you shouldn't have that problem anyways. Like my Corval deck, and basically all the decks that I've built for the channel through playtesting, they, they're all consistent. I, there's not one point in time I've sat down with my, my three color Corval deck that I've ever wished, man, I, I wish I had fetch lands because I've got the wrong combination of lands on the table. Yeah. That has never happened in like the 60 plus games I've played with the deck. However, if I had fetch lands in the Corval deck specifically, it might be a little stronger because that synergizes with Corvold himself. Right. And in that case, I think that there there is a home for fetch lands in decks that want to capitalize off of A, sacrificing a land and getting two lands into play, uh, essentially. Decks like Tatiova or decks like Moldrotha, you can, you know, you can replay the fetch from your graveyard. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty cool. Um, but I don't think that they're an auto-include in, in decks, especially if you're trying to improve your mana base, I don't think you necessarily immediately look to fetch lands. I think you you look at the mana symbols and the costs of your cards and you yeah. say, how many, am I playing enough sources of these colors to feasibly cast these spells? Because I mean, if you're playing a fetch land, what can you grab with it, right? You can grab- Shock lands, a shock battle land. lands. Yeah, and like, if you didn't have the, uh, the fetch in there, you would have just drawn that card anyways. Yeah. Yeah. If you built your deck right. So. The, uh, obviously, there is a small difference putting your fetch lands in. It's a, a, it, But I think the difference is going to be so nominal compared to not having them that the difference is just too... It's It's been created to be way bigger than it actually is. Um, Which is why we're saying you, you, don't, you, you don't, don't need them. You don't need fetch lands. Honestly, if you have a two-color deck... I, I have a lot of two-color decks, and I have never felt bad just playing basic lands. Like, sure, sometimes I'm not going to draw too much of one color or the other, but whether I have all the shock lands in there, like, the difference is so nominal, and the money is just much better used in different places. Let's, let's look at it from another avenue. Let's say you're playing a commander that costs five mana, and the deck that you're playing revolves around the commander. What are you doing between turns one and five? You're you're setting up. Yeah. If you play a tap land or two, it's not a big deal. You're still just setting up on turns one through five. Um, and I mean, I I do play some CDH. I do have a CDH deck, and in that deck, I I am playing fetch lands, but that's because I have a constraint on the deck to where I I can't have any two cards with the same name, and there just aren't enough fast options for lands in it for me to not run the fetch lands. And a majority of the game that I'm playing in CDH is on turns one through four. So I can't afford to be setting up with tap lands on turns one to four. But in my casual decks, like I'll mention my, my Corval deck again, oftentimes I'm just spending the first four or five turns just ramping. And that's that's how a lot of EDH games go. And that's that's part of the format, right? You Everybody spends the first couple of turns getting set up and then people start throwing punches. So I remember, I think you were there, Griff, when we were playing at our local game store and we were playing against a Nekuzar and a Muldrotha and they were both playing um, budget mana bases and I was playing my highly tuned up Marin deck and I, I can't remember what you were playing. Um, do you remember which situation I'm talking about? Yeah, I was playing Yannet. You were playing Yannet? Okay. I don't know what your mana base was like, but my base was, my mana base was really good. And it was a two color deck and there are a lot of options in green black for the Marin of Clan Neltoth deck and um, they wiped the floor with us. Like, and they were playing tap lands. And I was like, when he when he opened the gates of the game with a tap land, I was like, pff, pff, budget magic. <laughs> this goodness. guy doesn't stand a chance against my Marin deck. <laughs> and uh, turn seven. <laughs> game was when, over. <laughs> when I'm drawing like an extra, like eight cards per turn and Nekuzar just doming me in the head. <laughs> and uh, he ended up locking us out of the game. And I was like, oh yeah, 10 turns down the road, seven turns down the road, those tap lands in hindsight don't seem that bad. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the Muldrotha dude was doing. I just remember the Nekuzar deck being like crazy powerful because he was just setting up those first couple mm -hmm. of turns. Didn't matter. I've got a friend in my other play group that will not play uh, non-basic lands. And if he does, it's cards like Homeward Path to- Maze of Ith. <laughs> he hates Maze of Ith actually. <laughs> uh, he absolutely hates Maze of Ith. And he stomps our faces in with his Xanagos deck every single time. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And does that mean your decks are bad? That you guys are losing to decks that aren't- No, you should be no. putting fetch lines in it. That's <laughs> yeah, the difference. Exactly. <laughs> If I would have hit the fetch on turn four, I would have won against that Xenagos. Fifty damage to the face would have would have gone somewhere else. <laughs> the fetch lands and dual lands in my Myel deck have never saved me from getting stomped by the Xenagos deck. You're kidding. No, I'm not. So what you're saying is <laughs> you Fetch lands don't actually matter that much. <laughs> 
So the one thing that I'm thinking of, though, is that I also have a Jota deck, mm -hmm. which is all five colors. What do you guys think about needing fetch lands in a deck like that? Well, I mean, the more colors you have, the fetch lands become better. And obviously, at five color decks, the fetch lands are a little bit better. But again, the difference is going to be so nominal. In a five color deck, whether you're playing fetch lands or whether you're playing tap lands, you're getting the same colors. You're just maybe doing it a little bit slower. I think that the Jota, the specific Jota example actually harkens to the line that I said about unless your strategy specifically wants that, you don't need them. And I would argue that that specific strategy does want them because you have mm -hmm. to have Wooberg, right? Yep. I think in most other five color decks, if, if you look at it, you take your deck, you're going to notice that you are heavy on two to three colors or maybe one to two colors. But in a Jota deck, you are wanting to you stay need, right in that sweet spot for yeah, the Wooberg. Wooberg. Um, so I would say that, sure, you can... And we're not saying that you can't play fetch mm -hmm. lands index. We're just saying that it doesn't... If you are doing that in the hopes of making your deck stronger, you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna be successful. Mm -hmm. And if you've got the fetch lands, put them in your deck. We're not saying that like it's gonna make your deck worse. We're just saying that you don't it's not it. going to increase your chances of winning against somebody that doesn't have the fetch lands, and it's not going to increase your chances of winning if you if you do play them. The so. point, yeah, the point of this conversation is to just alleviate the myth that fetch lands are gonna make the biggest difference in your deck. If mm -hmm. you have the money to spend on cards, spend the money on your deck. You don't need to spend the money on the lands. If you want to spend the money on the lands, go for it. But it's just dispelling the myth that it's it's a big deal. It's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. And depending on the fetch land, that money that you would spend on it could actually buy you all of the pioneer lands, all of the shock lands, yep. and like all of like the good lands that you that aren't not, that are in between the the budget lands and the non budget lands. I would or. Budget lands and fetch lands. Yeah. Um, so Kaladesh lands, Battle for Zendikar yeah, lands. Yeah. Yep. All the, all yeah, the way basically all like the lands that are legal in, in Pioneer and like the the fast lands from Rodin. Yeah. And um, yeah, and the, and the shot. Yeah, basically that. So cool. in my Jota deck, I don't actually have all 10 fetch lands. I have six of the fetch lands and then I have cards like Crossan Verge that sure. comes into play tap, but it's still a fetch land. It just comes into play it's tap. It's a slow fetch. It's yeah, a the slow, slow fetch. fetch. Is, um, it's like an Evolving Wilds, but yep. for a specific... And then there's also Rocky Tar Pit and mm -hmm. all those from, from that set. That's a little bit different than Kroos and Verge, but uh, those work just fine as well. So if you absolutely, if you feel like you absolutely have to have some sort or of fetch land Or you're priced your deck, out of it and you don't want to spend the money, there then, are options. Yeah, they're like a dollar, mm -hmm. I think. I, it's been a while since I've checked those, but it's just as fast. And it's it's just like you were saying, it didn't matter that that Nekusar player had stuff coming into play tap the first turn. Same thing with Kroos and Verge. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. The second point that we as the Command Valley suggest that you don't need to do is that you don't need to have answers to everything. Now, what I'm talking about, I'm going to bring you into a scenario, and I'm just going to play this scenario out so I can illustrate what I'm talking about. Say that you're playing a is it deck and is it spell slinger deck and you're playing on this table and some person is playing a life draining deck like an aristocrats, maybe a regnant crab, maybe Marin, um, and you lose to uh, life loss and you thought in the game, if only I had something to gain more life. And the next time you, you play the deck, you put in more slots for life gain because you think, man, I need to be able to that I can answer this threat because I wasn't able to answer it in this game. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, sometimes it's gonna be, I need to have more board wipes for all creature strategies and I need to have more answers for this over this. Answers are good. I'm not saying that answers aren't good. All I'm saying is you don't need to have an answer for everything. Sometimes your deck is just going to fall short to another person's deck and that's fine. You need to use the slots in your deck to work towards your strategy instead of taking slots away to answer every single little nitty gritty detail about what could happen to you during a game. Having an enabler in your deck is much better than having uh, a life gain card. So I, I think an another like another way to word that would also be don't try and cover every single weakness of your deck. Um, I, I don't think it's possible. Like no, no deck is perfect. That's the whole idea behind the color pie, right? Like, and what you have to look at the advantages. Why are you playing a red, a red blue deck, right? What, why not play a deck that can handle life loss and handle enchantments? Cause that's another thing too. If you're playing red blue, you're SOL the, to enchantments. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, you can counter them on the stack, but other than that, like you can maybe bounce them, but that doesn't, that only temporarily right. solves the problem. So I think what Caleb said is super important. Look, look for your enablers, look for ways that you can win before that becomes an issue. So in, in red, blue, 
I hate to say it because it kind of contradicts something that we're going to talk about later, but you probably are going to look at a combo of some sort. Well, and I can, like, for example, um, I love Kess. I play Kess Dissident Mage. At one point in time, I had four different Kess Dissident Mage decks. That's crazy. It is crazy, <laughs> but there are so many different strategies with her that I wanted to explore a lot of different avenues. But something that I noticed with her is, and, and about certain strategies, is they're going to have weaknesses. And, and every strategy is going to have, like, their own win con. And the issue that I ran into with Kess was... She wants you to play a lot of instants and sorceries, right? She lets you play them from your graveyard. And you you're not you're not playing a whole bunch of creatures. And the typical way in commander is you win by attacking with creatures. Well, in all of my cast decks, I'm playing like maybe 10 creatures. Hmm. And the creature and I would consider that creature heavy. On average, I'm playing like four to five creatures. So how else am I supposed to win outside of swinging in with creatures? Well, I have to figure out some type of combo to win. Um, and that's just that's the way the deck goes. Like there are things that hose the deck. And there, you're going to find things that just hose your deck. That's just a bad matchup. Yep. Sometimes Is that what you're it, saying? Yeah, sometimes it's just a matchup. Sometimes you're just going to get pitted against somebody whose strategy of their deck is your deck's weakness. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Don't feel bad when you lose a game against a strategy that you weren't your deck isn't good for. And then try to put slots in of these bad cards just to deal with that strategy. Every deck is going to be different. Every deck is going to have different strategies. It's okay not to have an answer for everything. Now, counterpoint, you do want to have at least basic answers for things. Like we've talked before about like having answers for artifacts and enchantments and creatures if you can, but you don't need to have an answer for every small deal tell that could happen. You've got three other people at the table, right? And sometimes you can you can make deals, you can do a little bit of politic and you can do some wheel and dealing and try and maybe maybe get a deal to where something works out in your favor. But just because it doesn't happen that one time doesn't mean that your deck is bad and that you need to like go back to the drawing board and redo your entire deck. Like yeah. I think that's just, I think you'll spend more time uh, you're, you're, you're going to go mad from trying to reconstruct your deck because every game is going to be different from itself. And it, there's so many variables, like mm -hmm. matchup variables, even down, you could be, even have a good matchup and have a bad a bad start or a bad hand. And if your opponent has a good start and a good hand, they just curb you up. Yeah, they, yeah it. it's just, and that's, that's the beauty of Commander is the inconsistency. I mean, we're all trying to make our decks more consistent, but with a hundred card singleton, there's gonna, there Not is a huge possible. level of inconsistency. And even if your deck is very well prepared to handle big board states, like let's say in a red blue deck, you're playing um, Blasphemous Act and you're playing Cyclonic like Pyroclasms Rift. and you're playing Cyclonic Rifts. I mean, those are four or five cards in a hundred card deck. You might not always see them. And you just, I think you just have to understand that in those moments, your deck is not bad and your opponent's deck is not overpowered. It's just the way the game goes. Only one person can win and there's four people at the table, so. It's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. To put in perspective, if you go to look at our last Duel of the Peaks episode, I was in a position with my mono red Perforos deck where I was getting forested by the stupid freaking Song of the Dryad. I, I was getting Song of the Dryad over and over again. Song of the Dryad. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Yeah, I'm done. We'll just sing it every yeah, time that yeah, comes I'm out. Done. And there, there, there's two alternate ways you could look at it. You could be like, oh man, I don't have any way of dealing with these enchantments in red. I'm just going to quit red altogether. I'm going to only play things that can deal with enchantments. Be a good choice. <laughs> Move on to mono white. <laughs> yeah. um, but in that moment, in that game, I wasn't mad. Mono Red is not good at dealing with enchantments, and that's just the fact of Red. That's not a bad thing. It's not something I needed to change about my deck. It was just a matchup that went in Lannan's favor. I was also super lucky to have had the Song of the Dryads in my opening hand. That's actually why I kept that opening hand. Is it was a it was a pretty bad hand, but I yeah I, I knew how scary Perforos was if left unchecked, and there is evidence of that in the video in in the episode because the one turn he had perforos without a song of the dryads on it bro i went ham he went nuts <laughs> he dealt over 20 damage to all of us yeah that was a fun turn so yeah in in mono red we may not have ways of dealing with enchantments but we have plenty of ways of dealing with players i i think also in that episode you were able to make a deal uh somebody bounced did somebody bounce the song he, of the dryads for you he tried to make a deal with me oh but and, you you were the wiser and i said can't do it but p i think peter did eventually bounce peter yeah peter else. uh bounced all nine learned permanents twice i think mm -hmm. so that was great thanks peter you enabled me let's say that you have been playing a deck though for a while and okay. you're, you're wanting to make the deck better i want to make the deck better and you you do start noticing that you're losing to the same thing over and over again at what point do you start to say okay now i need to make a change to my deck that's a meta call for sure you think so yeah. yeah, I think it's a mental call. I think it's just a personal preference call. I think it depends on the thing that you're experiencing. I think if it's, I'm not able to cast my spells or I'm, I'm not able to stop my opponents. Cause I think you have to have, 
you have to have a measure of interaction, whatever that our interaction is. Yeah. Um, and like you want to play versatile interaction. Like you'd rather play a Vandal Blast over um, a Naturalize. If you're like, in a, let's say you're in Junt, right? Vandal Blast will probably be better than Naturalize. Yeah. So I think there is interaction that is better than other interaction. And you want to be as versatile as possible, but you don't only want to play interaction. Right. And you shouldn't be cutting other key pieces of good deck building for interaction or for covering a weakness of the deck. Unless like you're in like a super fixed meta where you're playing against like the same decks every single week. I don't know of too many metas that exist like that. Even between the four of us, yeah. we each have like 10 decks and that's enough variety to where it seems to be fine. It's different time. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think I just misunderstood you a little bit because I thought you were saying if you've already built and, and planned for having the, the most important removal or answers and you're losing to the mm -hmm. life the life gain issue somebody's on top somebody's gaining life faster than you or or draining you kind of like griffin talked about her if if that's happening over and over again in your meta i think that's more of what i was referring to no yeah I, i'm talking about you've already like put in the base amount yeah. of like interaction and stuff like that but also another thing that I would look into is look at the strategy that you're playing and see if there are cards that synergize with your strategy that maybe fix the problem. Like if you're playing... Peer's Whim is one of my favorite cards ever. Peer's Whim is a sorcery for three and a green, and it says, for each player, choose friend or foe. Each friend searches their library for a land card, puts it onto the battlefield tap, then shuffles their library. Each foe sacrifices an artifact or enchantment control. Mm. The reason I love this card is because I, I can ramp with it, but then also deal with stuff in my Myel deck. Yeah, it's a it's a two-fold card, right? Yeah. It's got it's got a dual purpose, and you want you want cards like that. You want like high versatility. But you shouldn't go too far to the side and say, "Yeah, no. I need to change my entire deck to like fix, yeah, to, to fix this problem." Yeah, you don't um, need, yeah, you don't need an answer to everything. You have the base amount, you have the suggestions, and it will depend on your meta what what's more prioritized or what's not. But I feel like there's so much expectation in the commander arena that you need to have an answer for every problem that comes up. You don't. It's fine not to have an answer to a certain strategy. If you're losing against life game, that's fine. If you're losing against graveyard shenanigans, that's fine. If you want to put a card in because your meta is playing that, then cool. But you don't need to have an answer for everything at all times. Sometimes it's going to be a bad matchup. Sometimes you're just not going to play well against that deck. All right, but just focus on making your deck better and more fun. Point number three, and this is this is a hot topic, and I can't I can't wait to hear Lance's opinion on this. Now this is not this is not contradicting anything that our playgroups believe, and I promise this is not contradicting that anything you guys believe either. You don't need to play infinite combos. Now, like, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. what do you mean? Again, meta call. Sometimes in your deck, you can play an infinite combo. Just like Lannan said, sometimes in an Izzet deck, the best way of being able to take out creature strategies is by having some sort of infinite combo in your deck. But there is a rising expectation, especially with CDH getting more popular, that's kind of pushing casual decks to be more competitive. It's okay. If you're a casual deck, you don't need to have an infinite combo in there. If you have one, great. If you like playing infinite combos, great, then you can do it. But if you're playing against people with infinite combos, don't feel like you have to add infinite combos just to be able to play against those decks. Just communicate with your play group. Just communicate with the people that you play with. If you want to play your decks the way that you want to play them, don't feel like you have to rise to the level of playing infinite combos just to be able to compete with those decks. Yeah, that's a little uh, a little peek specifically into the dynamics of our play group throughout like probably the past year and a half, two years. Lennon's turned to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I started putting combos. Like my decks were getting like incrementally stronger like i was just putting stronger cards and sh like more compact uh combos in there because i was getting like super hyper fixed on winning and like it, and it wouldn't always work I'm, I'm not saying that like i would win every single game and like it always worked out but I, I that's the goal i was going towards and i think on on a general level that increased the power level of our play group i think you guys all like kind of rose to that too and your deck started right. to get like and and when you guys did that i was like oh yeah i need to make my decks stronger as well like um, I built my first cast deck in response to Griffin's Yannette deck. He had so many freaking board wipes in that <laughs> deck that it was impossible to have creatures on the battlefield, it felt like to me. And I was like, fine, if he wants to blow up all the creatures, I just won't play any. <laughs> <laughs> and, I play, and that's when I built Kess, and I, I already had that feel of it. I went down the combo route. But um, I, I think what he's saying is it's absolutely true. You don't have to, don't feel like your deck can't compete with decks that have combos. In fact, that's why we kind of started our series, the Combo Breaker series, is because we wanted to educate people on combos. That You don't have to be afraid of them. They're not all invincible. A lot of times they're actually more fragile than you think. And a lot of them are actually easier to stop and to deal with than massive board states. Yep. 
Um, I remember one, one specific incident at our local game store on a Friday night commander. And we probably had, there were probably 40 people playing commander and we had three pods, three pods of four people at a, at, on one table. So 12, 12 people, three games of commander. And those three pods, all three pods lost to an Isochron Scepter combo. Oh, geez. The, and I, I was in one of those pods. It was a Urza Isochron Scepter combo. And the table to my left lost to, I think it was, somebody was playing uh, Crufix, the God of Horizons. And I don't know what the third pod, I just remember people saying that all three tables lost to an Isochron Scepter combo. <laughs> and I was like, what are the chances first that three tables in a row, there is somebody playing Isochron Scepter? I'll, I'll, that's high. Two, what are the chances that it wins all three games? That's crazy. Like, the, the chances of that had to be pretty small. And I think in, in the second scenario, there were probably points in time during those games where people could have interacted and stopped the combo from happening. So I think it's good to know the combos on a general level and, and just kind of understand how the game works and when you get priority and, and how these combos can stop and how you can interact. But I don't think the response to combos is playing combos yourself that yeah makes sense. it's communication I, I really liked what you said before i've i've been playing with the play group for the last eight years or so and we've noticed the same exact thing that you talked about the power creeps up mm -hmm. and not everybody updates their decks as often as the rest of the play group and so you've got people that are playing the same thing that they were playing in 2012 against the decks that we've been refining and tuning for the last eight years and the, the best thing that you can do, I think the two best things that you can do is just communicate with your group and say, you know, this is what my deck is trying to do. This is how early my deck can go off. And the, the next thing that you should do is if your friends are okay with it, you can give them suggestions on how they can make their decks better too. Sit down with your friends, look through their deck and say, why aren't you playing Rampant Growth? Here's one of my 25 <laughs> Rampant Growths. <laughs> this will make your deck get out faster. A little bit more consistent. Yeah. yeah. Um, for just like Landon alluded to, the experience that we had in our play group is Landon started playing infinite combos in Kess. Yeah. And none of us had ever played in the play group in infinite combos before. Like we've had like some combos that were like kind of weird and like they came out every so often, but it wasn't like a specific win condition that would happen every and, single and time. And the decks weren't actively trying to combo off. Right, that wasn't yeah. their win condition. Yeah, it would just, it would just the, happen. The of the deck. And so, in, yeah, in response to that, I was like, well, I'm losing against this deck so much, so I got to build something that can own up to it, that can stand up to it. And I built a Solvala deck that had the infinite combo with the Umber Mentals and the Staff of Domination. It Ooh. was strong. It No, it was- It, it was really it strong. Was it was an extremely strong, and I played that deck maybe three times, and every single time I won with that infinite combo, and I never liked it. I never felt good playing that infinite combo. I didn't have the same enjoyment off of winning of that infinite combo. They can and get I'm boring so yeah, fast. I'm not saying that that's not a good way to win. That's just not the way that I wanted to play Magic. That wasn't the way that I enjoyed winning. So the the point that I'm trying to make is you don't need to play infinite combos. Is that if that's if you're like Lennon and that's the way that you like to win, then go for it. Do infinite combos. But if you're somebody like me who it's not as fun as the other games that you play in Commander, then that's also fine too. You don't need to put infinite combos into your deck just to play against other people who are playing infinite combos. Also, just, just a disclaimer, neither of us at that time even knew what CDH was. Like I wasn't <laughs> trying to be like a pub stompy jerk trying to beat up my friends. I was, I was just trying to not like have my like board get wiped every other turn and be in top mode deck for like an hour. Like I didn't, I didn't enjoy that. And so that was my response. I wasn't trying to like uh, make it so my friends couldn't play magic. I was just trying to actually play magic myself. And I'm really happy about that because um, I, I enjoy CDH because it's, I don't mind doing the same combo every time because sure it's the same combo, but I have to go through so many different lines every time to pull the combo off that every game to me feels like a puzzle. And I, and I really enjoy that. And, I, and now I know that my friends don't enjoy that. I don't play in my Kess deck with them. I've, I've built other decks that I can, I can play with them and it's, what? That's not true, you still play Kess. I, but I, he always <laughs> tells us that he's gonna no, pull no, it out I, I built all a, say okay. I built a second Kess deck. That's true, for that's that. true. I built a second Kess deck with way fewer combos that took way more cards <laughs> to pull off. Fewer. <laughs> okay, but like, 
I no, I get it. Though, I wouldn't even consider my CDH cast deck an infinite combo, right? It, right. it doesn't it doesn't generate anything on an infinite scale. Mm -hmm. It just has a very compact win condition. Yeah, it's a it's a win condition that yeah. requires less. And I can do it as turn as turn two, turn mm -hmm. one. But like all my other decks take a lot longer to set up. They require more of a board state, which I think also um, we need to mention that about power level is how much of a board state or board presence do you have to have to win? Because mm -hmm. that's also indicative of power level because my CDH Kest deck can win on turn two with no board state. And a lot of my other decks, I have to have like five or six pieces on the table to even come close to winning. One, one point that I want to make that goes hand in hand with what Griffin said earlier about you don't need to play infinite combos in your deck to be strong. Um, I, I mentioned earlier my Marin of Clan Neltoth deck and Caleb also plays Marin of Clan Neltoth and played this combo. It's the Nim Death Mantle, Ashnod Zalter, Ashnod Zalter, and any any creature that enters the battlefield and makes more than one token. So Grave Titan, which is one of the best cards in the deck. Yeah, or Avenger of Zendikar. And something that I noticed with that deck is there were some games when I was like spending so much time trying to assemble all of these pieces of the combo, and I felt like most of my games I was just I spent more time looking through my deck with tutors than actually playing Magic the Gathering, playing yeah. Commander. <laughs> And I was just like, my deck was so much more fun last month when my deck was all about reanimating big splashy creatures than going from for some stupid three card combo. Yeah. And I ended up taking that combo out and going for just a more reanimator strategy, playing, you know, spore frogs and caustic caterpillars and like I love those guys. They're awesome. They're so cute. I love them. And like playing like really cool flashy Shaeldreds and like Arch yep. of Depravities and just that was so much more fun than trying to assemble um, this like super silly combo that I, I just spent more time searching my library and shuffling and asking my opponents to cut my deck and crunching numbers in my head, seeing if I had enough mana to go off this this turn. Yep. And that's not the type of puzzle that I like to solve. Um, it just, it wasn't super fun for me, so. I almost never go for that unless the game is kind of in a lock and I can get Sadisi. If I get Sadisi, then I can search for multiple things mm -hmm. really quickly, and that's when I go for it, and, only when it's in a lock. And that's, that's a good point too. There are some games that like overstay their welcome. It's like, we have been playing this game of Commander for three <laughs> hours, but nobody wants to concede, right? Nobody wants to say, yeah, let's just go to game the next game. So I think if that happens regularly in your meta, it it might be worth it to maybe throw in a combo to where you can end the game because people are not having fun and maybe there's like, oh, just a super huge board stall and it's not going anywhere and you just want to get to the next game. Yeah, that's... Just to, to end this point off, the best way to look at it is looking at the official deck strategies that Wizards talks about, and that's aggro, mid-range, control, and combo. Combo is not the best way to tune up a deck. It's just simply a deck style. And you're not a bad person if you play a combo deck, because that's simply just a deck style. Combo decks suffer so badly against aggro decks, and aggro decks do really well against control decks, and control decks do really well against mid-range decks. There's just a lot of ins and outs to Commander, and I just want to make the point that having an infinite combo does not make you a salty player, it doesn't make you a pub stomper. It's a deck style. Or a tryhard. Or a tryhard. What does make you a tryhard, though, is sitting down at a table with a deck that you know is way stronger than everybody else at the table, and you're doing it intentionally because you're a tryhard, yeah, right? You're, you you're trying you're trying to win, and you haven't communicated that with the other people at the table. Yep. And mm -hmm. half of your turns take 30 minutes to deal two damage and then pass, but you create a massive board state. Win three turns later. They're also yeah. 30 minutes long. So it's just a matter of communication. The more communication that you have and the more honest communication that you have, I think the better experience you're going to have with your playgroup. I agree. So, I think right. number one, it's communication, and number two, it's education. It's fine to have combos. You don't need to have combos. Point number four, and this is an interesting one because this is actually outside of the game itself. And <laughs> this this holds close to my heart because I love politicking. But point number four, you don't need to make deals in Commander. And this all comes from an experience that Lannan and I had, and I'm sure many of you guys have been in the same position. We were playing a game of Commander, and I looked at my hand, I look at the board, and I'm like, well, lannon has got a really good board state, and maybe if I can make this deal with him, then I can win next turn. So I asked him if he wants to make the deal, and he says, yes, I'll, I'll make that deal. Anyway, it passes to his turn, and he goes off on his turn, and he sits there, and he realizes, well, I can win. And I said, well, no, hold on. You made that deal with me where you wouldn't do this, which stopped him from winning the game. And he just kind of sat there like, well, I can win the game. And this really has been making me think about deals in, in a different way in that I feel like there's so much expectation to make deals all the time. I play with so many people that sit down and want to make a deal right off the bat. And that you don't need to make deals in Commander and you don't need to keep deals if you can win. I almost 
never make deals. I never make deals with Griffin. <laughs> it will always end badly for you. <laughs> I'm actually starting to learn that. I'm a little bit newer to this playgroup, and literally every time I've made a deal with Griffin, he wins a game. He wins the game. I, I have learned at this point that Griffin is only making a deal with you because he is about to win the game. <laughs> Which is funny because you guys know Eli from my other play group. Yeah. He's, he just drafted with us. He has been trying, we all have nicknames mm -hmm. in my other group, and he's been trying for months to get everybody to call me the politician because I'm the one that makes those kinds of things, those kinds of plays in my play, in that other play group. And so now I know exactly how everybody else feels about me playing against Griffin. <laughs> and it's it's not always fun unless you're Griffin. No, it's true. <laughs> I make deals a lot. And the thing is- I No, no, you you try to make deals. I try to make deals You a lot. throw out a lot of deals. Bruh, if I'm in a new play group, they don't know what's gonna hit them. Anyway, <laughs> I, I do, I try to make deals a lot. I like politics. I like the fun in the game of Canada, but I get into these positions so much where I make a deal with somebody and like at that point, either they're gonna win the game or I'm gonna win the game. We're sitting in the stall like, well, you know, social contract says I don't wanna break this deal, but I can win. We can just move on to the next game. I, I don't have that expectation that if you make a deal with somebody and they can win that they need to hold that deal. That is just, it's a, it's a slimy thing to do. It doesn't feel good for either person. If you can win the game and you have to break a deal to do it, just do it. It's a game of commander. There's gonna be plenty of other games of commander. You're not a terrible person for breaking that deal. In that situation with Landon, Landon should have just won the game. Yeah, I and I think when I said that I don't make deals, I think it's because I'm really politically challenged. I think I just I don't make deals because I I just have this this impression that they're always going to backfire or I'm going to make a wrong deal or I'm not going to get enough out of it. I'd rather just not worry about it and just worry about like my board state. Yeah. However, there will be times when I look at the board and say we need to deal with this, right? So like I I would rather make a deal with the two other people at the table against the arch enemy, then randomly make a deal with somebody that eventually I'm just going to have to kill. And that, and that's the that's something that I say a lot to the people at the table when we're playing against Griffin is, you do understand that eventually it's gonna to have to come down to you and him, right? Like ultimately he's trying to win the game and I will make deals, I, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I will make deals if there obviously is one arch enemy and the game is going to be over if we don't band together and do something or, or pitch our resources together to take out a problematic thing. But other than that, like, I'm not a huge fan of, hey, don't swing at me next turn. I need to do this. And it's like, well, I don't know, man. Deals, again, are fine. If you need to make a deal like Lennon said to deal with a threat, somebody has a mind dilation, somebody has an ember cool, and you need to deal with that threat, and you, you're making a deal with the other players, it's like, hey, let's pool our resources to deal with this then yeah, like those deals happen a lot. But when you find yourself in a situation where you've locked down the game because you've made a deal and you're not gonna let anybody win because you, you've made that deal, then I think you should reevaluate the way that you're politicking and the way that you're making the deals. Cause at that point it's unhealthy and it's unnecessary. I think you should definitely talk to your play group before you do just backtracking a little bit. Definitely, if, if you've made that deal with somebody and now you can't win the game because of it, I do think that before you just go for it, you should say, hey, look, I, I can win the game right now. Are you okay with me breaking our deal? Because I feel like with some people, if you make a deal with them and then you break it to win the game, that's when they're gonna hate you or get mad the most. And you won't be able to make deals with them in the future. They won't be able to trust you. Right. I think I think what we're, we're kind of alluding to when we, when we say deals is a little bit ambiguous because um, a lot of this, it seems to deal with like attacking or like, interacting with certain things. Yeah. But it's not talking about cards or or things such as Piers Whim that you talked about earlier. Right. It's, it's a very uh, non game affecting type right. of deal. Like mm -hmm. like letting like choosing friend or foe on a friend or foe card or attempt with discovery type of card. Right. Or um, what's a, what's another one that I was just thinking about? Um, like a factor fiction yeah. type of deal where you right. have to like choose one. Of choose the one. I just a cool interaction that I've seen in just in watching like CDH gameplay and playing CDH is there's a, a one mana instant called Chain of Vapor where you can bounce a non land permanent back to its owner's hand and they can choose to copy the spell by sacrificing a land and the next person that they target uh, they can also copy the spell if they sacrifice the land. So if, essentially, <laughs> there could be a chain of vapor going until everybody ha nobody has any lands left to sacrifice. But how they work it is if somebody goes for the win by playing a combo, uh, what they'll do is they'll, the, the person that's trying to stop the win will cast the chain of vapor, targeting somebody else's key piece, putting the pressure on them to then sacrifice a land to stop the person from winning. It's literally putting the ball in somebody else's court and saying, hey, oh, geez. 
I'm giving you the chain of vapor that you need, but I'm gonna make I'm gonna bounce something of yours too. <laughs> and you have the choice in your hands right now to sacrifice the land and, and bounce this, or else we're just gonna lose the game. That and so you you get basically a two for one at that point. I mean that's a huge tempo swing for one one mana. Um, and I'll, I think that I like that. That's not you're not making any deals. You're just yeah. That's not the kind of that is, we're talking. That about. is like a strategic a strategic play that either prolongs the game or ends the game really fast. So mm -hmm. yep. Um, and like we we get that politics is a huge allure to commander, right? This is the only format in which it exists. And it, like we're not saying that you you shouldn't do it or that you can't do it. We're just saying that you don't have to. You don't don't, have to make don't deals. feel that pressure from from the people at the table pushing you to make the deals and the pressure from the format being the political format. If you're sitting there with a hand and it's you you're gonna win on the next turn and somebody is trying to make a deal with you, you're like, hey, don't do this and I won't do this. You don't need to make that deal. Just be like, you know what? If I'm gonna win this game, I'm gonna win this game. If not, we'll shuffle up and play another one. There was a there was a moment that that this happened in our last in our duels of the peaks with the uh, Theros got the Theros set, um, where I asked you if you were going to attack me. Uh, if I could, uh, hold on, how was it? Yeah, you asked me if I wouldn't if I wasn't going to swing anything with Perforos or at me. with Perforos his ability at you for a couple of turns. And I said, I can do it for one turn. And you're like, nah, that's not good enough. And you just, <laughs> it's not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was holding, I was holding that song in the dryads in my hand. And when he said that, cause one turn, I was like, nah, nah, that's not enough. <laughs> I wanted like, I wanted like half the game or more. And when he didn't give me what I wanted, I was just like, no, that's, yeah. you're going to get a song in the dryads. I, I so, didn't need to make that deal. And it didn't have to pull down to <laughs> my level to make that deal. Politics in Commander is simply just a way to make the game a little bit more interesting. It's not a way to stop people from winning or having Opening fun. up lines of play that probably otherwise wouldn't have happened and to add a little bit more creative restrictions to the format. But it's not, yeah. It's I not don't, a win condition. I don't, I wouldn't even say that it like ultimately defines the format either. Um, so. It's just part of the format. Anyways, that was long winded. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Next point. <laughs> Bottom line, you don't need to play deals in Commander. You can make deals, you can politic, just be smart, communicate with your play group. Don't try to make deals that stop people from winning. The fifth and the final point, and this is probably the most important point that I could ever tell in the history of Commander ever, or the history of this channel. Point number five, in Commander specifically, you don't need to win. But it's a game. It's it competitive. <laughs> There's people. You have to pub stop them every time. What do you mean you don't need to win? What does that even mean? What do you mean by that? Well, what are you saying, Griffin? I mean, you this don't? is Magic the Gathering. You're trying to win against everybody. <laughs> Guys, this is Commander. This is the only format. And this is, I think this is the reason why this is the, if not the most popular format in Magic. It's because it's casual. It's because you're sitting down with three other people with decks that you've built to express yourself and to have a good time. Statistically, you're gonna win maybe one in four times and you're not gonna win every game. And that's not a bad thing. Again, going back to previous points, like sometimes you're gonna have a bad matchup. The point of the point of commander is to have a good time. If the point of commander is to win for you, then yeah, maybe you should probably look into CDH. Maybe you should look into standard or, or modern. Or just a more competitive play group, right? Yeah. Like you don't necessarily have to like go in all all in on the CDH strategy. Just find a play group where everybody wants that at the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where, where people start to have the problems is when they're in a play group where maybe two people are just playing casually, one person is playing really competitively and another person is just, you know, trying to win. And I think that dynamic, yeah, it's gonna, they're gonna be some, there's gonna be some salt this, there's going to be some bad feelings, but yeah. I think that people just kind of need to man up. <laughs> I don't like, I don't necessarily like that choice of words, but I guess what I'm trying to say is it doesn't mean that you're less of a player and your deck is weak if you don't win the game. And I think you don't need to take it so personally when, when you don't come out on top. Not at all. I mean, everybody in our play group has at least at one point in time guaranteed sat at a table, lost the game, and just felt bad afterwards. It's like, I can't believe I lost that. Like, or and grumpy. just- grumpy. Yeah, grumpy. Like I didn't, man, I just drew all lands and you just, it kind of like makes you feel icky. And we're, nobody plays magic besides having fun. The reason that we play magic is because we have a lot of fun with it. Whether you're trying to win, whether you're trying to not win and just have fun. Like we're, this is all a game that we enjoy. This is all a game that we can share together. And especially in commander, like you're not gonna win every game. And even in standard, even in drafts and thing, you're not gonna win every game. I think the most important thing and the thing that can make your, your play experience and your play group so much better is if you relieve that expectation that the point is to win. Mm -hmm. Obviously you're trying to win, 
but you're not going to win all the time. And yeah, that's fine. That. Yeah. I think another thing that causes people to have that super negative feeling at the end of losing, I actually would go as far as to say that it's not necessarily the losing that they're upset about. It's probably the way that it happened. I think a lot of times people either there's something that somebody else did at the table that they didn't like and thought was either unfair or rude, or they felt like it something was stacked against their deck and they, they drew unlucky or their deck didn't perform correctly. And I think in either of those situations, I think you're just focusing on the bad and the negative. Mm -hmm. I think you're just focusing on, on, yeah, I'm just going to repeat myself. Sometimes it's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, well, and I think in those situations, you have the option to look the other way and focus on what your deck did right, or from a constructive perspective, focusing on maybe what you need to do to make your deck a little bit better or play better. And if you've already been doing that, maybe just understand that it was just a rough game. You know, if you're playing a lot of games, you're statistically speaking, you're just going to have some bad games. Also, one of the one thing that I've done, because this was really hard for me for a long time, and you guys have even seen one. I, I don't get grumpy when somebody else wins because their deck performed really well and mine was fine. I get so mad at my decks when they don't perform right. And that, that really hurts uh, me in the feel bads. But I think one of the best things that I've learned to do is to say, hey, Landon, that was an awesome play. Good job winning. I think that's probably the best way to combat feeling bad after a game. Just looking over at your opponent's yeah. board and being like, holy cow, that was a sweet game. You literally read my, I was literally going to say that, that like complimenting your opponents on what they did well and what you thought was cool will not only strengthen your play group and, and develop a better bond so that in the future there is a less less of a risk of being salty, it will also just make you a happier, more positive person. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that I've really tried. I'm really bad at that because I think I'm a little bit more on the narcissistic side, <laughs> but I try my best to like compliment my opponents when they've done something cool. And I, I think that just makes games of Commander just a lot more enjoyable. And also, for the record, Caleb's grumpy is so mild that <laughs> him saying that, I had to like really rack my brain thinking about grumpy no. Caleb. And I, I, there's nothing that file not found. So don't ask my other play group about that. <laughs> they've, they've been through the worst of it. <laughs> How many times have you sat down in a draft or even a standard modern commander and at the end of the game, somebody didn't win and they go through all the reasons why they didn't win? Like, oh man, I drew too many lands. Oh yeah. man, I didn't do this. Oh man, I, you know, if I only had this. And it's like, the point here is is you didn't have to win. That's fine that you didn't have to win. You also both had the same percent of that happening to you. Mm -hmm. You that could have happened to either one of you. That's the that's the game, right? It's the name of the that's game. That's yeah. literally the definition. It's a card game with and your deck is randomized. You, sure, you built the deck, but like the order in which you draw the cards is completely random. It's just that's how it goes. You win some, you lose some, and it's fine. You are there to have fun. The best thing that you could do to make your experience of playing Magic just so much better is yeah, be fine with losing. Compliment your opponent for winning. Like yeah, they have the better chance that game. Maybe they even played better. Learn from them too. Yeah. Like learn from like their deck building or learn from like the sequencing in which they, they take their turns. Like I'm not going to say that and be cheesy and say, some of the most fun games I've ever had is when I didn't even win. I just enjoyed what my deck did. <laughs> nah, I, I like to win, right? Like I play CDH. I like when my deck does what it does and it wins. However, I've had a lot of great times with my friends when they win and my deck did what it was supposed to do. It just came short or like I got to like do the super weird interaction or a new interaction that I hadn't even noticed when I built the deck. That's awesome. I love those experiences, but I also like to, uh, I like to win. <laughs> It's fun. <laughs> I think my expectation of winning is probably a lot less than most because, uh, yeah, everybody likes winning. But sometimes, especially for me, going back to my Attempsis deck, the first time I played the Attempsis deck, and actually every time from, from that I've built it to now, my win is just taking out one person with with Attempsis. Or seeing how everybody else reacts to Attempsis. That's hilarious. That like, is. Everybody's <laughs> like constantly asking him how many cards he has in his hand. <laughs> and like... The, the just, collective yeah, arch enemy against like, attempts. What what is he doing over there? Like you're not sure. But <laughs> and it's just so fun. Like even if I there was a game that I played with Attempsis where I lost the game first with Attempsis and I was doing really well. I had all the draws that I needed. I got all the cards that I needed and it was really good. 
but every single opponent was teaming up to destroy Atemsis every time she came out. I had a turn where I casted a Karn's Temporal Sundering with Marari Conjecture that had just gone off, and I had two copies of it. And they both got countered by different opponents. Oh, jeez. And, you know, I could have sat in that moment, and I could have just looked down at my cards, and I could have just given up and say, you know what, this is, this is stupid. Like, nobody let me do what my deck wanted to do. But, you know, the way that you could look at it, and the way that I tried to look at it is, man, I was such a threat in that game that two people had to counter both of my extra turn spells. That's and a you know really what? That's, good point. that's the two sides of the same coin, right? You can either... You can either like take negative responsibility and blame everybody else, or you can take responsibility and see what your deck did well and the presence that your deck had at the table. Mm -hmm. um, that's well said. Smart yeah. guy over here. So in summary, you just have to understand a little bit. It's a little bit of a, a thought exercise, a little bit of change in philosophy. You don't have to win every game. You're not going to win every game. And if you spend more of your mental energy focusing on the positive and the cool things that not only your deck did, but your opponent's decks did, it's going to strengthen your play group probably help you build better decks and have a more enjoyable time and it's going to increase your longevity in the commander format. These are the five biggest things that we think that you guys don't need to have in commander. And to just sum it all up, and this point has been made from, from Caleb Lannan and I, and I just wanted to end off with this, is all of these five points also come down to the fact that it's all based on the people that you play with. Every deck is gonna be different. Every play group is gonna be different. Every meta is gonna be different. It, it, there's no perfect way to build a commander deck. There's no perfect way to play commander. It all depends on what you want, what your meta wants. Play the way that you want and just have fun doing it. We're just here to tell you that you can find that balance and we're here to just try and help people find that too. Cause we found it in our play group. We've been together playing for probably five years now. Um, and we've had a very healthy, I mean, I think this channel is evidence that our play group has been able to maintain a pretty healthy meta and just a healthy relationship. I mean, we're we're more than just like people that do a YouTube channel together. You know, we all consider each other to be really close friends. And and with that, this show's coming to a close. Thank you guys so much for listening this far up to this point. If you have comments or just things to add on to any of the points that we've said, don't hesitate to leave those in the comments. We we genuinely do read these comments and we we love them. And if you have other things that you think should have been added to this list or maybe hot takes, we love to hear them and we'll try our best. We will try our best to not only read them, but respond to them. And please like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you can be notified about our future deck tech videos that come out every single Monday, our gameplay series. We've got episode three of Duel of the Peaks coming out sometime this month, so watch out for that. And we will have more episodes like this every now and then. Yeah. <clears throat> and with that, my friends, may you draw well, may you curve out, and stay safe out there.